My stepmother hates me, and my dad has no idea. How do I tell him without tearing our family apart? I have an amazing dad who raised me since my mom passed away when I was five years old. He is my friend, my supporter, and someone who I want to be like when I grow up. When my dad first introduced my stepmom to me I was ten years old, and she was very nice to me and he looked so happy that we met and hoped we could get along. They got married when I was thirteen and I was so happy that my dad and I had a new member in our family. I thought me and stepmother were getting along until I think a few months after their honeymoon she told me one morning that we just need to pretend to like each around my dad. But when he is not here that I shouldn't bother her. Honestly this shattered me. But I agreed cuz I didn't know what else to do. After that day whenever it was just me and stepmother she would say things to get to me and I would just not say anything. I'm introverted and don't like confrontation so I just took it and thought over time she would get over it but it got worse. She would talk about my height and weight and say I was a funny looking version of my dad. I hoped my dad would notice but he didn't. He actually thinks me and stepmother are so close and she understands me. He looks so happy with her that maybe it's worth not saying anything and giving it time. This year my stepmother has started picking on me around my dad and he has either joined in or ignored it. I have voiced that what she says makes me uncomfortable and hurts, but my dad says she is teasing and doesn't mean it to hurt me. Well right now I'm at my ends and I'm scared I'm angry, frustrated at my stepmother and my dad. Dad was away for work, and it was just me and stepmother at home, she had a party at home with a couple of her friends. I helped set the house up and cook dinner cause dad asked me to help out which was fine. After they ate and just hung out they were hanging out on the porch when I heard stepmother and her friends talking very loudly outside my window while I was in my room. Stepmother friends talked about how lucky stepmother was to have a nice husband and a house, when they mentioned how nice it was that I cooked for them. Stepmother told them that I was annoying and weird and she hated me and living with me and couldn't wait till I was 18 to kick me out. I was shocked that she hated me that much, but I didn't know why. Teeth. I thought we were tolerating each other. But to hate me I must have done something but I can't think of what I did. I've been kinda down since that day which was two weeks ago and I thought I was past the initial feelings. But at rugby training today I bursted into tears and my coach sent me home so I drove to a beach and cried. I was feel so much I honestly can't describe my emotions. I eventually fell asleep in my car, now I'm here hoping I can get advice on how to talk to my dad about it, cuz I'm scared about how he will react. I don't want my dad to be sad cuz he does so much for me but I'm not strong like him. I'm really struggling. My question is, how can I approach this conversation with my dad about my stepmother hating me, or should I tell him at all? Too long, didn't read. I heard my stepmother tell her friends she hates me, and I want to tell my dad about it but don't know how. Edit someone questioned my dad's age, and I'm sorry, but it was supposed to be 42 but I can't change it. Sorry thank you everyone that provided advice and kind words. It means a lot to me. I have read every comment and have an idea on how to approach this situation. I'm honestly terrified of the outcome being negative, but the encouragement and support are making this a bit easier to deal with. I am going to talk to my dad on Sunday and show him this post. I hope it goes well, and I hope all of you stay safe and take care. Edit 2. I'm not sure what I am able to do what I planned, cause Amy just took my car keys away, and she wants my phone but I won't give it to her so she is waiting for my dad to take. Take it off me because apparently I'm doing drugs, but I told her I'm not. I've been at the beach. I'm not sure, but I just want it to stop cuz I can't handle it. I'm sorry. Yip date one. Okay, so my post was locked, but hopefully it's okay now. I've posted the link and tried my best with spacing. I'm on mobile, if I can't post it. I give up. For all the support and advice received, I really appreciate and wholeheartedly so grateful for all who DM me to see how I was. Thank you. This will be long because a lot has happened, but many things are still not resolved. Trigger warning. I will mention self-harm, so please if it might trigger you peels don't read further. I wish I was able to say I followed the advice that was provided, and now everything is better, but some things in life don't play the way we want it to, and we can either let it destroy us, or make us better. After writing my edit where my stepmother was taking my things away, and assuming I was on drugs I started recording on my phone, and she said a lot through the door. Many things about my mom and me, and just plain hateful words that I don't want to repeat on here. I fell asleep while I was barricading the door with my body when my dad demanded that I open the door. At this point I don't remember much of what happened, but my stepmother told me I had to leave the house, and my dad agreed. I didn't know who to call but I decided to call my coach and he picked me up, and I was a crying mess. He didn't ask any questions but just told me that I was safe, and if I needed to talk he was here for me. I stayed over one night when dad picked me up, Stepmother was not at home when we got there. Dad told me we needed to talk, we had breakfast and my dad spoke to me about many things my stepmother told him, 
and I couldn't believe all the lies she told him. It was a long talk, but in summary it was. My use of drugs and alcohol. How I disrespect her in our home I don't do my responsibilities like chores at home. I'm nasty to her when dad is not around. He asked me why I was acting like this. And if I had a problem with my stepmother I should have spoken to him. I let him talk. And when he was crying and asked if I had anything to say. I was so lost for words I knew whatever I said my dad was on my stepmother's side. So I told him I wanted him to watch the recording of the incident that I can send through as an email attachment and the link to my Reddit post and then we can talk more. I also said I didn't want to be here when he was reading and watching so I'll go for a drive and he can text me when he's done and ready to talk. He was hesitant at first, but I told him it was important to me so he agreed. And I left in my car to the beach and sent the email with the video attached and the link to my Reddit post. I don't know how long I waited but many thoughts were going through my head. I was missing my mom so much and what if my dad still sided with my stepmother? What can I do now? I fell asleep at the beach spot and was woken up by a police officer knocking on my car door and asking for my name. After confirming my name he advised me to get out my car and to hand over my keys to him and to follow him to his car, he handcuffed me and assured me that I wasn't in trouble. But this was a welfare check cause someone made a call that I was possibly suicidal. I didn't talk after he told me that, and all I remember was just crying. He made me sit in the back of the police car until the ambulance came and they took me to the hospital. I was asked many questions and was evaluated and was told I was depressed and may have extreme anxiety. The physician did say I might have other things but will require further testing and some sessions with a psychiatrist. My dad came and visited me while in hospital, and when I saw him he looked really tired. When he spoke it sounded like he was crying and he told me he called the police on me because the video recording I did. He heard everything my stepmother said but he also saw cuts on my thighs and was scared and thought the worst. Honestly I never watched the video so I didn't know my thighs were visible. After our cry we spoke about a few things. I told my dad that I don't feel comfortable living with stepmother after everything she said and done to me over the years and I'm not sure I can handle being around her cause I don't trust her. We spoke about arrangements and knowing my dad still loves my stepmother and I didn't want him to choose between us. I told him that I could talk to coach if I could stay with him and after calling him he agreed. I've also been admitted to an agency that will support me cause I am mentally unwell. I have have been to one session and waiting on another evaluation to be done on me and some testings with my general practitioner so they can diagnose me. I'm currently staying with my rugby coach who has been an amazing pillar. He has set out some house rules but I respect the fella and don't mind following them. My coach even set a date next week for me and dad to catch up on. My coach is an awesome dude. I thought of him as just a coach who just wanted our rugby team to win. But when he allowed me to stay over, he showed so much care for me, and I saw a side to him and understand how much he cares for my team. He has a lovely wife but I'm kinda anxious whenever it's just me and her at their house. That's it right now my dad lives at home with my stepmother and is trying to sort that out. I have many appointments to get the help I need and a lot of schoolwork to catch up on and rugby training to attend. I've taken a leave of absence from my Maka's job. I'm gonna miss going to the beach for a while but I understand that it's not a forever thing so I hope that the next time I go there, I'm not crying my eyes out. I'm kind of working on being okay if my dad and stepmother after those of you who shared your similar experiences, someday I'll be okay. Thank you to all who advised me and encouraged me. Those who reached out through direct message, thank you for the kind words and reaching out. I'm not sure if I'll update again but maybe I'll let you know if something happens in the future. Take care everyone, also be kind to one another, and most of all be kind to yourself, cause you deserve it. Too long didn't read. I showed my dad my Reddit post and recording of my stepmother being verbally abusive, and now I'm staying at my coach's house trying to sort out my mental health update too. Hope everyone has been doing well. I wasn't going to update at all but many who reached out shared their stories and kind words. It truly helped me. I wish I was able to reply but so many things were happening and I'm sorry. This will be a long one but it's because this will be the last time I hope. In my last post my coach sorted out time for me and my dad to catch up weekly. I've met up with my dad twice and this is how it went. First catch up at the beach. We spoke and I told him a lot about what happened between me and his wife. I mentioned how she would treated me when he wasn't there, what she spoke to me after they got married, and how she was awful to live with. I told him how I dealt with it for his sake cause I wanted him to be happy. I mentioned to him that I spoke with the coach about staying there until I go to university and then I'll move away cause I cannot live with his wife anymore cause I'm not sure what I'll do. I'm never gonna try and get along with her anymore. He listened and was crying and asked if I would ever get over this. I told him no and I never wanted to see his wife and walked off cause I was pissed off at what he said and drove back to the coach's house. He messaged me later. I acted like a kid, and I responded, 
cause I am a kid. Second catch up dinner at the coach's house. Second catch up, my coach invited my dad to have dinner and hang with me. My coach has a pool table in his man cave and a pool. I was excited to hang and catch up with my dad even after our last meetup cause I was feeling a bit better. But at the same time I was feeling anxious about the meetup like I had a bad gut feeling. But I ignored it. Dinner went great and me dad and coach had fun playing pool. Later on that night the coach gave us space to talk. Dad talked about my mom and me as a kid, just things he would tell me when I was a kid, and it was just me and him, it was fun, and I really enjoyed our time together. When it was time to go home I offered to drop him off since he drank, but he said his wife was here to pick him up so I hugged him and he went. I kinda stayed in the garage and waited for her to leave so I could walk in the house, but I heard her say, How's the little shit? And I bolted out the door and told her to fuck off. Boy was I not ready for the slap my dad gave me but all I remember was swinging a punch at him and knocking him down and my coach pulling me off my dad. My coach told my dad and his wife to leave. After they left I told my coach I never wanted to see him again and texted my dad we were done. It doesn't end there. Last week I planned to not go to school on Friday and go for a drive up the line with a few teammates to just get away from everything. They ended up bailing, so I went by myself. I ended up driving to a lake and parking up and just chilling for the school day and just driving back home later on. When I got home at my coach's house I saw my dad's car parked in the driveway and thought I would have to square up with my dad. When I parked up my dad ran out the house and looked like shit. He looked like he cried for days and he started hitting my car screaming to get out the car and tell him where I was the whole day. I thought he was mad that I wagged school so he ripped the door open and hugged me so hard and cried. I had no idea what was happening or what he was saying. But all I could understand was, I'm sorry and I love you. After what felt like forever he kinda calmed me down and I asked him why he was here. And then he told me there was an accident with a kid getting hit by a train. And it clicked my dad thought it was me. He said when he heard the news he called the school, and they said I was a no-show and called everyone he could think of. My mates said I went for a drive somewhere but didn't know where, and my dad said he lost it. He calmed down eventually, and said he would divorce his wife if I wanted him to. But I told him, he needed to choose that for himself. Cause the reason I stayed quiet was to make him happy. If he is unhappy to make a choice for himself. Cause I don't want to be the reason he is unhappy. And that now I have to look after myself. And that is getting away from her. And he cried and just said, more sorries. He ended up sleeping over in the same room as me that night and the night after. Cause I think he was scared. And just trying to deal I was okay with it. And coached allowed it. He left after the weekend to sort himself out back at his home. I told him that where I am is good for me and to not worry, and that I'll turn off do not disturb on my phone so I could see texts. That's pretty much it really. I don't know what my dad is going to decide to do with his wife but I am definitely not ever going to associate with her, ever in the foreseeable future. I love my dad too much to stop seeing him, but he knows my boundaries since I've set them out clear as day, and he knows as much as I love him. I will cut him off if I feel like it's not for me. I'm moving past what happened between me and my dad's wife for me cuz I'm tired of letting her beat me in my mind so I just gotta work on myself. I'm currently happy staying with my coach and his wife, they have been amazing and have shown me so much love. They have awesome kids who I have met, and they have invited me to their family Christmas. I feel bad that I feel anxious when I'm around the coach's wife but I'm working on it with my therapist, and I have a good support system. I know I want to go to university but not sure if I want to study commerce or law, but I know I am on track with my studies, I just can't afford to skip school anymore. Thank you to everyone who sent messages of support and reached out to share your experiences. Y'all gave me the strength to believe I could get out of this mess and be okay. And if you ever feel down that there is help out there for you no matter where you are in life, I'm glad I shared on Reddit cause I've learned so much about me and many things I won't forget and teach to my kids. Now I gotta go school. Take care and cheers OP posted in mom for a minute on Sep 27th 22 about turning 18. Can't repost from this sub. I hate that my current reality is that I don't have people I can rely on right now in my life. I am trying to do the best to survive and better my current situation. I've had so much happen to me this year and I feel like I can't afford to take time for myself, to catch a break, or else I'll lose what I currently have, which is not much. I know I'm young and have so much to look forward to but it's hard. Like so hard to want to carry on when so much shit is going wrong. I'm trying to find a place to stay even in a flatmate situation to be more independent but I can barely afford anything. My job offered me a better paying position at the expense of a full-time job, and even though I would love more money that means I will have to give up my dream to go university. I know many people have had worse situations and honestly, I don't know how they found the will and help they got. It really feels like the world just hates me, and I know I'm feeling sorry for myself but I honestly giving up hope. What can I get the family I'm staying with for Christmas? I, 
18M, feel indifferent about catching up with my dad, 42M. I, 18M, have a strained relationship with my dad, 42M. A lot has happened this year between us, and it really ruined our relationship. He was my best friend, would be there for my rugby matches and pushed me to do my best. Earlier this year I had a fallout with my stepmom and my dad which caused me to move out of my home and in with my coach, 37M, who I call uncle. I have been here ever since. We did try to mend our relationship but harsh words were exchanged and I stopped reaching out and focused on passing my exams. I have worked hard on myself by working at my job and helping out at the place I'm staying. I have made some sort of peace about my situation and focused on my future. Now my dad reached out last night to meet up with him to hang, and we planned it for next year on the 4th of Jan, I agreed, and that was that. My uncle talked to me about what me and my dad spoke about, he was kinda worried about my feelings about meeting my dad because of my feelings towards the day. I explained the best I could, is that I just feel indifferent about my dad right now. I am not excited or scared about this meeting, I just see it as a date I'll be seeing him and that's it. Whether we meet up or not, I'm not bothered by it at all. My uncle and his wife care a lot and have done so much for me so I care about what they say. They think I should have a reason to meet up with him since I haven't spoken to him in a while and worried I could get hurt. Should I have a different mindset towards catching up with my dad? Too long, didn't read. Dad planned to catch up next year for me and him, we had a fallout so my uncle thinks that I should be feeling something but I feel indifferent. A commenter asks how it went. Okay this reply took a while because I wasn't ready to share but I'm okay for now. My dad turned up with stepmother and told me that they were having a kid. I congratulated them and we spent time talking about my future and dad telling me he can pay for my university studies as long as I keep my grades up. We spoke about a lot and then we said our goodbyes and I left. I wasn't able to drive home cause I started crying and had to call my uncle to come pick me up. It's been a few weeks since the meeting and now I'm not sure about my feelings about everything but focusing on getting ready for uni, so I'm working a lot more. My uncle and I are planning to go check out his other house that was affected by floods, so that's something to look forward to because I need a change of scenery. Thanks for checking on me, it means a lot. You'll do well, OP. Go out there and be successful for yourself. Your uncle and wife are really a gem. That's a couple you need to return the favor or love one day. So have you decided what major you will do in uni? OP. Most definitely. They are honestly the best support I have and I am forever grateful to them both for sharing their home, family and love. Sometimes I wonder why they do it and they always remind me it's because they care and love me, which means a lot. For uni I'm going for a bachelor's in commerce majoring in commercial law and accounting. Very excited about it and looking forward to it. It will take some years but that's okay for me right now. The father is not leaving the stepmom and OP is working to move forward. I'm flaring this concluded. I quit my six-figure job to care for my ailing father then I found out about his secret life and thousands of dollars gone. Now I'm torn between confronting him or walking away forever. My name is Daniel, at 29, living in a bustling metropolitan area just an hour's drive from where I was raised. I find myself in a juxtaposition of worlds. My high-paced urban life as a successful software developer contrasts sharply with the quiet suburban life of my family. Earning $200,000 a year, I've established a comfortable existence in the city, complete with a sleek apartment overlooking the skyline, a wardrobe suited for tech company Cheek, and a social circle that revolves around tech meetups, weekend hiking trips, and the occasional high-end restaurant outing. Yet despite this seemingly ideal setup, my thoughts frequently drift back to the single-story house nestled in the serene suburbs, the place I still call home. The house, with its fading red brick facade and the large oak tree my father planted the year I was born, cradles more than just memories. It embodies the ongoing story of my family. My mother Jane, at 64, still powers through her work week, dedicating over 60 hours to her managerial role at a local logistics company. Despite the toll it takes, she brings home $95,000 annually, a sum that barely stretches to cover the essentials and the medical bills that have begun to pile up. Her resilience, often silent and unacknowledged, has been the cornerstone of our family's survival. Living with her are my father, Michael and my older sister Sarah, along with her spirited 4.5-year-old son, Ethan Dad, age 73, retired a few years back. His days of working as an electrician are behind him, replaced now by afternoons on the porch with a crossword puzzle. The remnants of a life spent in labor quietly fading into the routine of a man sustained by social security checks. His recent health scares, multiple heart surgeries aimed at preventing strokes, have marked him with a fragility that is both new and deeply disconcerting. Sarah, 
having never quite recovered from a tumultuous divorce, teaches at a local preschool. Earning just $60 an hour, she relies heavily on our parents for support. The echoes of her laughter, once the soundtrack of our childhood, now seem muffled by the weight of single motherhood and financial strain. Ethan's youthful energy brings a much-needed brightness to the house, his innocence a stark contrast to the complexities of the adult lives around him. Growing up the warmth of family was the foundation of my world. My parents, though never well off, ensured that my sister and I lacked for nothing essential. They poured their energies into nurturing our interests, mine in computers and hers in art, fueling our dreams with the kind of unwavering support only parents can provide. This backdrop of familial love and sacrifice has shaped my understanding of responsibility and gratitude. Even as a teenager, I understood that the financial planning my parents had managed wouldn't suffice for their retirement. The inevitability of my role as their future financial backbone became apparent early on. It was a silent promise I made to myself, standing in our modest backyard, looking up at the stars, a promise to give back to the two people who had given me everything. My life now, filled with coding sprints and software launches, is worlds away from the simplicity of suburban rhythms, yet the success I've found in the city isn't just mine. It belongs to my family too. Each achievement, each milestone reached, is a testament to the sacrifices made in that small house. This connection pulls me back, time and again, to where it all began. The phone calls began to increase about six months ago. Mom's voice, usually steady and calm, carried a tremor of worry as she updated me on Dad's health. The surgeries, the complications, and the haunting diagnosis of microvascular dementia and cerebrovascular disease that followed. Each call etched a deeper line of concern into my daily life, a stark reminder of the ephemeral nature of time and health. It was during one such call, as I gazed out over the city lights from my apartment, that the decision was made. The pull of my family's needs outweighed the allure of city lights and fleeting tech trends. I knew then, with a certainty that rooted itself deep within me, I needed to return home, to be there in ways that phone calls and weekend visits simply couldn't cover. So I started to plan. Plan for a future that involved more than just my personal aspirations plans that would weave the safety and well-being of my family into the fabric of my daily existence. This wasn't just a decision born out of duty, but out of a deep-seated love and a commitment to those who had shaped me. This return home isn't merely a change of address. It's a reorientation of my life's priorities. As I pack up my city life, each item I place into a box, a book, a photo, a souvenir from a tech conference, is a tangible reminder of the journey I've undertaken. Ahead lies a path filled with challenges and adjustments, but also with the opportunity to give back in the most meaningful way possible. As I maneuvered my sedan into the familiar driveway of my childhood home, the crunch of gravel under tires felt like a metaphor for the uneasy reintroduction to a life I once knew. Stepping out, I was greeted by the sight of my mother, Jane, at the front door. Her smile was warm but worn, the kind that spoke of countless worries weathered over years. She wrapped me in an embrace that felt both comforting and desperate, her way of saying she needed help without uttering a word. Inside, the atmosphere of the house was thick with the scent of nostalgia mixed with tension. My sister Sarah stood in the kitchen, a half-smile playing on her lips as she juggled making dinner and entertaining Ethan, who buzzed around with the boundless energy of childhood. Our greetings were brief, a stilted exchange that belied the deeper currents of concern we all felt but didn't voice. Sarah was visibly thinner than I remembered, her face drawn not just from the fatigue of single motherhood, but from the constant strain of living in a house clouded with uncertainty. The first few days were an adjustment, a recalibration of roles within our family dynamics. My mother continued to work her hours unyielding despite the added emotional load. At night, we sat at the dinner table, conversations skirting around the unspoken, dad's condition, the financial strain, the future. It was during these meals that I truly understood the full extent of what had been kept from me in our phone calls. The weight of dad's medical expenses, the fear of what was to come, and the everyday challenges of caring for someone who was slowly forgetting the life he had led. Dad's interactions with us had changed profoundly. Once a lively storyteller, his conversations now lost their thread, his frustrations palpable as he grappled with the gaps in his memory. Observing him, I saw flashes of the man who taught me to ride a bike, who fixed broken appliances with a magician's ease, now struggling to remember names, faces, and dates. The impact on mom was heartbreaking. She oscillated between being a caring spouse and a weary nurse, her face etching deeper with lines of sorrow each day. Sarah's reaction to my return was mixed. Initially, there was relief, an extra pair of hands to help, a reprieve from her role as the primary support. But as days passed, old grievances surfaced. We clashed, not just over small mundane things like household chores or schedules, but about deeper issues. Resentments about past decisions, particularly my choice to move away and pursue my career, came to light. You left just when things were getting tough, 
she accused one evening, her words slicing through the fragile piece. And now you just waltz back and expecting to fix everything. These confrontations were painful but necessary. They opened up dialogues long overdue about our roles in this family, about support and sacrifice. It was through these difficult conversations that we began to navigate our new reality. Slowly, we started to forge a path forward, not just as individuals living under one roof, but as a cohesive unit facing a crisis together. Through it all, my bond with Ethan became a source of joy and escape. His innocence and unbridled enthusiasm for life reminded us all of the simpler joys. In his world, the problems were as solvable as figuring out the right block to fit into a puzzle. He became my little shadow, following me around, asking questions, his laughter a balm on the rough days. As weeks turned into months, my role in the family began to solidify. I found myself balancing my work remotely with attending doctor's appointments with dad, discussing financial strategies with mom, and providing moral support to Sarah the shift was palpable. Where once I was just a visitor in their lives, I now became an integral part of the household's daily rhythm. One evening as mom and I sat on the porch watching the sun dip below the horizon, she turned to me, her eyes glistening with unshed tears. I'm so glad you're here, she whispered. It's been hard, harder than I ever let on. But having you here makes it feel like we can manage this, like we're not alone in it. Her words struck a chord. I realized then that my return was not just about providing financial or physical support. It was about healing, about mending the frayed threads of our family fabric. It was about showing up, not just in times of crisis but every day, proving through actions that family, with all its imperfections and challenges, is worth every sacrifice. The transition back home wasn't smooth. It was fraught with adjustments, misunderstandings, and at times heartache. But it was also filled with moments of profound connection, understanding, and gradual healing. In this house, with these people, I rediscovered the essence of home. It wasn't just a place, but a feeling of belonging, of being needed, and most importantly, of loving and being loved unconditionally. The stability we once took for granted began to shake when my father's health declined. The man who taught me how to throw a baseball, who could fix just about anything broken, found himself battling a series of health issues that seemed to come one after the other. It started with heart problems that required immediate and intensive medical intervention. The terms TAVER, transcatheter aortic valve replacement, and CAR, transcarotid artery revascularization, became unexpectedly familiar as we navigated through the complexities of cardiac surgeries designed to prevent strokes. Despite the doctor's efforts, a stroke slipped through the cracks of medical prevention, leaving him with small vessel disease and vascular dementia. His cognitive functions began to deteriorate, a stark contrast to the sharp wit and immense knowledge he once wielded effortlessly. Making the decision to move back home wasn't easy. It required me to uproot the life I had built in the city, the late-night coding sessions, the weekend hikes, the network of ambitious tech-savvy friends. I had to step away from a promotion that was almost in reach, trading potential career advancements for family responsibilities. It was a trade I made willingly, driven by an innate sense of duty that my parents had instilled in me from a young age. Moving back to the suburban home where I grew up meant reacquainting myself with its rhythms and routines. My old room, once a shrine to teenage ambitions and dreams, now seemed smaller the walls echoing the past. Adjusting to this life meant quieter evenings, the absence of city noise replaced by the subtle sounds of a house that breathed with the lives of its inhabitants. It meant seeing my father's empty chair at the dinner table when he had particularly bad days, and it meant stepping into the role of caretaker, a role I had never envisioned in my youthful imaginings. To aid in my father's care, I introduced technology that I hoped would bridge the gap between his needs and my ability to meet them. The AirPods Pro I bought him connected him to his favorite music and shows, providing comfort when the confusion of dementia clouded his mind. More significantly, I gifted him my Apple Watch Series 8, equipped with health monitoring features. This watch became a crucial tool in tracking his heart's behavior, particularly its ability to detect atrial fibrillation, a condition we now watched meticulously. The transition was emotionally taxing. The joy of being close to my family again was often overshadowed by the realities of my father's condition. Each doctor's visit, each small sign of his worsening health, reminded me of why I had returned. I spent countless hours researching ways to enhance his quality of life, from diet changes to cognitive exercises that might slow the progression of his dementia. That night was unusually quiet, the sort of silence that seems almost anticipatory, as if the house itself was holding its breath. After dinner where conversation fluttered nervously around mundane topics, I found myself restless. With a mind that refused to quiet, I decided to tinker with some of the tech gadgets I'd brought for Dad, thinking perhaps I could distract myself. Dad had always been somewhat wary of technology, but he had taken a peculiar interest in the Apple Watch I gave him, fascinated by its ability to monitor his heart rate 
and other health metrics. It had become a routine for me to help him set it up, ensure it was charged, and sometimes reset it to make sure it was functioning optimally. That night, as I took the watch into my hands, I noticed it needed resetting. The screen was lit up with notifications, too many for Dad to have possibly managed on his own. As I navigated through the menace to find the settings, a message notification popped up briefly before disappearing. My curiosity peaked. I ventured into the messages app. It was then I noticed the recently deleted folder had entries, something I hadn't expected Dad to know how to use. The logical part of my mind suggested there was a simple explanation. Perhaps Mom had deleted messages after borrowing his watch. But something about the late hour, the quiet of the house, and the nagging sense of unease that had settled in my stomach compelled me to open the folder. The messages I found there were not just surprising, they were shocking. The texts were not from family members or old friends, but from an unknown number, discussing arrangements and meetings with an unsettling familiarity and explicitness. Each message was more revealing than the last, discussing times, locations, and payments. The content was clear. My father had been communicating with a prostitute broker. I felt a cold wave of disbelief wash over me, followed by a sharp pang of betrayal. My father, the man who had taught me the values of honesty and integrity, was leading a secret life that was now laid bare before me. I sat there, the watch heavy in my hands, as I struggled to reconcile this image with the father I thought I knew. Driven by a need to understand the full extent of this betrayal, I logged into his brokerage account, which he had shared access with me years ago for emergencies. What I found only deepened the chasm that was opening up inside me. The account, which should have held close to $100,000, was now down to $66,000. The transaction history showed several withdrawals of $3,000 each over the past year, coinciding with the dates mentioned in the deleted texts. The room felt like it was spinning as I pieced together the implications of these withdrawals. This wasn't just a moral transgression, it was a financial betrayal that affected our entire family. The money in that account was supposed to be part of my parents' retirement fund, crucial for their care especially given dad's health condition. Yet it had been siphoned away to fund clandestine meetings that shattered the facade of the life we had been living. I sat alone with this information well into the night, the glow from the screen of my laptop casting shadows on the walls. The weight of what I had discovered felt overwhelming, not just in its immediate impact, but in what it meant for the future. How could I confront my father about this? What would this revelation do to my mother, who had already borne so much, and what of Sarah and Ethan? who lived under this roof, innocent and unaware of the storm that was brewing. The night's revelations hung heavily in the air, tainting the familiar comfort of my old bedroom. I lay there, staring at the ceiling, grappling with a whirlwind of emotions from anger and betrayal to an overwhelming sense of desolation. Growing up, my father was my hero. He was the one who taught me to ride a bike, to respect others, and to stand up for what I believe in. But as I grew older, I witnessed the facade crumble. Behind closed doors, his relationship with my mother was fraught with tension and discord. He spent money with little regard for our family's financial stability, indulging in whims as if the act could fill the growing voids within our household. My mother, in stark contrast, was the pillar who bore the financial burdens, working tirelessly, yet never allowed herself the luxury of even the smallest indulgences. In my early twenties, the strain had become unbearable. I had issued an ultimatum to them, resolve their issues or face losing me. At the time, it seemed like a necessary threat. Looking back, it only served to deepen the divide, especially with my mother who felt caught in an impossible situation. She resented the position I put her in, yet continued to patch the seams of our family fabric in silence. The night before, as I delved deeper into my father's deceit, the years of pent-up frustration and disappointment erupted. The discovery of his communications with a prostitute broker, along with the significant withdrawals from his brokerage account, was the last straw. This wasn't just a moral failing, it was a betrayal that jeopardized our family's financial security. Sitting at the kitchen table that morning, surrounded by the remnants of my childhood and the shired pieces of the respect I once had for my father, I felt a profound sense of alienation. I couldn't face my family. I couldn't look into my mother's eyes, knowing the additional pain this would cause her. So, I made a decision. One that now, in the quiet solitude of my city apartment, I questioned with every aching part of my being. I left. Without a word of explanation, I packed a bag, the weight of each item seeming to anchor me further into a quagmire of guilt and confusion. I left a note, vague and insufficient, expressing a need for some time alone to think. As I drove back to the metropolitan bustle from which I had come, each mile widened the chasm between my family and me, both physically and emotionally. Now, sitting in the dim light of my apartment, the city sounds a dull roar in the background. I am plagued by uncertainty and remorse. The silence of the space amplifies the chaos of my thoughts. I ponder the irony of how I, 
who had returned home to mend and care, had fled when the reality of my family's imperfections became too stark to bear. I'm struggling with the dichotomy of my emotions. On one hand, my father's actions are indefensible, a reckless endangerment of our family's stability and my mother's sacrifices. On the other, he is still my father, the man who, despite his flaws, played a crucial role in who I am today. How do I reconcile these two sides? How do I balance the scales of justice and filial duty? I remember my mother's words from years ago, after I had issued my ultimatum. She had said, we all have our demons and disappointments, but we don't have to carry them alone. Her words echo in my mind now, a reminder that perhaps abandonment isn't the solution, but a continuation of a cycle of hurt. I find myself typing out my thoughts, casting them into the void of the internet. Perhaps someone out there has faced similar crossroads, has navigated the murky waters of familial obligation and personal integrity. I seek not absolution, but perspective. How do others deal with the complexities of family dynamics, where love and disappointment are so often intertwined? As I sit here, the cursor blinking expectantly, I realize that my journey back home isn't just about geographical distance. It's about bridging the gap between the son I was and the man I need to become. It's about facing the hard truths, not just about my father, but about myself and my own reactions. It's about understanding that in the tapestry of family, each thread, however flawed, contributes to the strength and pattern of the whole. Tomorrow, I will call my mother. I will not offer excuses for my abrupt departure but I will listen. I will try to understand her side of this lifelong partnership that has borne so much strain. And perhaps through these conversations, we can begin to forge a new path forward, not just for her and me, but for our entire family. For now, I sit alone with my thoughts, the city outside unaware of the turmoil within. But I am resolved not to let this night pass without reaching out, without trying to mend what has been broken. For in the end, family is not just about the good times shared, but also about navigating the storms together, and emerging, perhaps a little battered, but whole. I find myself in a situation where I desperately need some guidance, and I hope you can offer me your opinions and possible solutions. After uncovering some troubling secrets about my father's actions, which have jeopardized our family's financial stability and emotional well-being, I'm torn about how to best handle the situation. I left home abruptly, driven by a mix of anger, disappointment, and confusion, and now, sitting alone in my apartment, I'm struggling to find the right course of action. This discovery has not only caused a rift in my family but has also left me questioning my own decisions, especially my immediate reaction to flee. The dynamics in my family have always been complicated, shaped by long-standing financial strains and personal grievances, and this latest revelation feels like a breaking point. I am reaching out to you, the community, in hopes of gaining some perspective on how others might navigate such a family crisis. How do you balance personal integrity with familial responsibilities? especially when faced with deep-seated issues like betrayal? How can I approach this situation in a way that might help mend the relationships rather than cause further damage? Your insights and advice would be invaluable to me during this difficult time, and I truly appreciate any thoughts you share. Thank you for taking the time to listen about my situation, and for any guidance you can provide. I thought I had the perfect marriage until an anonymous email turned my world upside down. Now, I'm questioning everything. I'm John that day I'm sitting in my office at home. The glow from the computer screen barely lighting up the room. It's just another evening, or at least it was supposed to be. Lisa and I have been married for three years now. It's my second shot at this whole marriage thing, and I've been putting everything I have into it. We've had our good days and bad days like any couple, but I've always believed that what we have is solid, built on mutual respect and understanding. As I glance at the clock, I see it's just after 7 p.m. That's when an email notification catches my eye, an anonymous sender which is odd and unsettling. Curiosity mixed with a hint of dread compels me to open it. Attached are several pictures with a message that chills me to the bone. See for yourself what your wife does when you're not around. I hesitate for a moment, but then click through. The pictures start loading, and I feel a cold sweat breaking out. They show a woman engaged in sexual acts with different partners. The woman's face is cleverly obscured, no eyes, no complete facial features that would make her instantly recognizable. Just parts of her mouth, her nose, things like that. Despite the lack of full facial recognition, a sinking feeling in my gut tells me, it's Lisa, I know her body, every curve, and every line. There's no mistaking the familiarity of the shapes and details in those images. But there's no absolute proof. Just a terrifying possibility. I try to tell myself it can't be true. This has to be some sick joke or a mistake. But denial is a heavy blanket, suffocating and full of fear. I run my hands through my hair, trying to make sense of it all. My heart is racing, anger bubbling up, 
but there's also betrayal slicing through me. I sit back, overwhelmed by emotions. How do I even begin to deal with this? The thought of confronting Lisa terrifies me as much as it compels me. What if it's true? What if it's not? I'm caught in a storm of doubt, and every possible outcome feels like it's going to tear my life apart. I shut down the computer. The screen goes dark, and I'm left in the quiet of my office, alone with my thoughts. It feels like the walls are closing in on me, each second heavier than the last. I need to talk to her, to confront this head-on, but I'm scared of what I might find out. The rest of the night stretches out before me, long and uncertain. I reopen the email after a brief respite, steeling myself against the tumult of emotions it had already stirred. The images, still there waiting like uninvited guests, seemed even more imposing than before. As I began to click through them, my focus narrowed on the crafty ways each photo was manipulated to obscure the face of the woman they claimed was Lisa, in one image. The angle was such that her hair fell forward, curtaining most of her face except for her lips. Those lips, slightly parted in a familiar expression, sent a jolt through me. They resembled Lisa's, especially the way the upper lip peaked in a subtle bow, just like hers when she smiled. Another photo showed only the side profile from the nose down. Her nose, the slight bump on the bridge from an old high school soccer injury, was unmistakable. Or at least it seemed so to me. Each photo was a puzzle, a sinister game of hide and seek. Eyes, the windows to the soul, and perhaps the most identifying feature were always conveniently blocked by a hand, a shadow, or the angle of the shot. It was clever. Too clever and it felt personally tailored to inject doubt and paranoia into my thoughts. Turning my attention to the body in the photos, I tried to be as objective as possible, which proved almost impossible. I knew Lisa's body intimately, the mole on her right shoulder, the faint scar on her thigh from a childhood fall, the tattoo of a little star on her ankle, hidden, unless you knew where to look. As I scanned the images, each of these marks checked out, aligning with what was represented before me. The turmoil in me grew as these recognitions piled up. The emotional roller coaster jerked me between denial and reluctant acceptance. How could someone so similar to Lisa exist? And why would someone go through the effort of staging these scenes with a look-alike? The logistics of such a deception seemed far-fetched, yet the alternative, that it was indeed Lisa, was devastating. My methodical comparison grew obsessive. I fetched old photos from our trips to the beach, paused videos to catch her in motion, matching moles and scars with the woman in these unsettling images. Each match twisted the knife a bit deeper, each similarity a confirmation I wished to avoid. Sitting there, surrounded by these digital and physical fragments of my life with Lisa, the doubt was suffocating. My mind raced with scenarios, explanations, justifications. Could there have been a mistake? Could this be an elaborate hoax? Yet the personal details, the intimate, tiny landmarks of her body, how could they be duplicated so precisely? I felt betrayed. Not just by the potential actions the photos suggested, but by the invasion of our private life, the exposure, and the scrutiny it forced upon us. It was as if our intimacy had been stolen, repurposed to play someone else's cruel game. The trust I had in Lisa, in our bond, felt undermined, slowly eroded by each click through the photos. I needed to confront her, to ask her to hear her deny it with her own words. Yet, a part of me dreaded that confrontation. What if her denial couldn't extinguish the seeds of doubt these images had planted? The prospect of living in a constant state of suspicion was paralyzing. The emotional weight of the situation was overwhelming. Here I was, dragged into a nightmare scenario, piecing together the reality of my marriage from digital shadows and hidden truths. My love for Lisa battled with the creeping dread that something fundamental in our relationship was amiss. As I sat there, alone with my thoughts in the glaring light of the screen, I felt a profound sense of isolation. The room seemed to close in around me, each breath heavier than the last, each thought darker than the one before. The tension was palpable as I sat at the kitchen table, waiting for Lisa to come home. I had decided that confronting her was the only way to move forward, whether to clear the air or confirm my fears. The printed photos lay in a neat stack beside me, their presence like a physical weight. Lisa walked in, cheerful and unsuspecting, her day evidently having gone well. She noticed my somber mood immediately and her smile faded as she approached. What's wrong? She asked, her voice tinged with concern. I took a deep breath my hands trembling slightly as I slid the stack of photos across the table towards her. I need you to look at these, I said, 
trying to keep my voice steady. Lisa looked puzzled but picked up the photos. As she flipped through them, her confusion turned to shock and then to anger. What is this? She demanded, her eyes finally meeting mine, filled with hurt. These came to me today, anonymously. They're saying it's you in these pictures, I replied. Struggling to maintain composure, Lisa's face hardened. And you believe them? You think I would do this? It's hard not to, I confessed, my voice cracking. I recognize things, Lisa, your mole. The scar on your leg. Are you kidding me? She interrupted, her voice rising. Do you know how many people have moles or scars? This is ridiculous, John, but it's not just any mole or scar. It's where they are, how they look. It's all too specific, too familiar. Lisa threw the photos down and crossed her arms. I can't believe this. You think I'm capable of this just because of some photos that anyone could have manipulated? I don't even know these people. Her denial was adamant, her indignation clear. John, this isn't me someone is trying to mess with us, to ruin our marriage, can't you see that? How can you let some anonymous trash shake what we have? I felt torn, her words battling the mounting evidence before me. I want to believe you, I do. But I'm scared, Lisa. I'm scared of what it means if it's true. And I'm scared too, she replied, her voice softening. Scared that you don't trust me, that our marriage means so little to you that you'd think I could betray you like this. We stared at each other, the gap between us filled with doubt and pain. Look, she continued. I've been with you here every day. When would I even have the time to do this? Her gesture to the photos was one of dismissal of contempt for the accusation they represented. But how can someone fake this? It looks so real, so exact, I murmured, more to myself than to her. Photoshop John ever heard of it. Lisa was almost scoffing now. People can create anything they want with technology these days. Why is it so hard to believe that someone might want to hurt us? Her arguments made sense, and yet the doubt lingered. I don't know what to believe anymore. Lisa sighed her anger receding somewhat as she saw my distress. I am telling you the truth. It's not me. I don't know how to prove it to you beyond telling you and trusting you'll believe me. I nodded, the conflict within me churning. I need some time, Lisa. I need to think. Fine, she said, her voice thick with emotion. Think about our marriage, whether my words mean anything to you. She left the room then, leaving me alone with the photos and my swirling thoughts. The confrontation had not brought the clarity I had hoped for. Instead, it deepened the chasm of uncertainty and mistrust between us. As I sat there looking again at the pictures, I realized that no matter what the truth was, the damage was already significant. Whether these images were real or falsified, the seed of doubt had been sown, and I wondered if it could ever be uprooted. After Lisa left the room, I remained seated, the silence of the house amplifying the turmoil within me. My heart raced as I picked up the photographs again, each image echoing back my deepest fears and insecurities. This wasn't just about the pictures, it was about trust, about my ability to discern reality in my own marriage. The thought of someone deliberately trying to sabotage our relationship was terrifying, yet the alternative, that Lisa could betray me so profoundly, was equally unbearable. The internal conflict gnawed at me. Doubt and suspicion clouded my judgment, making it difficult to separate rational thoughts from emotional reactions. Every moment I had spent with Lisa over the past years replayed in my mind, each memory now tainted with a shadow of doubt. Had there been signs I missed? Had her laughter been a little too forced, her excuses a little too convenient? Reflecting on my past relationships, Particularly my first marriage, I recognized a pattern of mistrust and insecurity that had contributed to its downfall. I had promised myself not to carry these insecurities into another relationship, yet here I was, feeling the same old fears creeping in. It pained me to admit that perhaps I hadn't learned as much as I thought. The realization that my unresolved issues could be projecting false narratives onto Lisa was a bitter pill to swallow. I pondered the implications of both possibilities. If the photos were indeed of Lisa, the betrayal would cut deep. It would mean she had been living a double life, deceiving me while pretending to be committed to our marriage. How could I continue to live with someone who had shattered my trust so thoroughly? Could a relationship survive such deceit? On the other hand, if the photos were a fabrication, our marriage was being tested by an external threat. Would Lisa forgive my doubts and my accusations? Could she understand my fears? Or would she see them as unforgivable? As I sat alone, the weight of the situation pressed heavily on me. My love for Lisa battled against the horrifying possibility of her infidelity. This struggle was not just about whether I could trust her, 
but whether I could trust my own judgment. Had my previous experiences clouded my perception to the point where I could no longer give her the benefit of the doubt, the house felt emptier than usual, the rooms echoing back my conflicted thoughts. I missed the comfort that Lisa's presence usually brought, yet her absence allowed me the space to think without influence. I needed to determine where these feelings were coming from. Was it simply fear? or were there legitimate reasons for my suspicions, I decided to approach the problem logically. I listed facts and evidence on one side, emotions and feelings on the other. The facts were thin, anonymous photos, no concrete proof, just coincidences in appearance. The emotions, however, were thick with fear, insecurity, and remnants of past hurts. It was clear that my emotional response might be clouding my ability to see the situation clearly. The more I thought about it, the more I realized how crucial it was to communicate openly with Lisa if we were to overcome this. Whether as a victim of a cruel hoax or as a couple facing infidelity, we needed to face it together. Hiding my feelings or allowing my insecurities to dictate my actions would only lead to further damage. I also considered the broader implications of either scenario on our future. If Lisa was innocent, we would need to strengthen our trust and possibly seek help to deal with the trauma of this attack on our marriage. We might even need to investigate who would want to harm us this way and why. If she wasn't innocent, then I would have to make some tough decisions about my own future and what I could forgive. Sleep was elusive that night. The bed felt colder, the shadows in the room longer. My mind raced with scenarios, each more painful than the last. The early morning hours brought no relief, only a deepening sense of unease. By dawn, I had reached a decision. I would confront the situation head-on, seeking clarity and truth, regardless of the outcome. I owed it to both Lisa and myself to resolve this doubt once and for all, to reclaim the trust that was the foundation of our relationship, or to accept its collapse under the weight of truths too heavy to bear. As the first light of morning filtered through the curtains, I prepared myself to face whatever the day might bring. My heart was heavy, but my resolve was firm. No matter what happened, I needed to find peace and move forward, either with Lisa by my side or on a new path alone. As the investigation into the anonymous photographs unfolded, the emotional stakes were incredibly high. I grappled with my doubts and my commitment to uncover the truth, while Mark, the digital forensics expert, meticulously dissected the images. Each discovery he made amplified the tension. The superimposed details, the artificial blending of shadows, the digital breadcrumbs he uncovered did not just hint at manipulation, they screamed of a deliberate malicious intent to deceive. When the source of the email was finally traced back to an old friend of Lisa's, someone whom I had met and trusted, the betrayal felt like a physical blow. This was a person who had sat at our dinner table, laughed with us, and all the while harbored intentions to dismantle our happiness. Confronting him was a dramatic showdown. We met in a quiet corner of a local cafe, the air thick with tension. His initial denial added to the suspense, his face a mask of feigned ignorance. But as I laid out the evidence, his facade crumbled. The admission when it came was not just a simple confession. It was a torrent of pent-up jealousy and frustration. I loved her first, he blurted, his voice cracking with emotion. You were never right for her. I thought once you were out of the picture she'd see that. His words were like daggers, but they paled in comparison to the pain of his betrayal. The confrontation left me reeling, not just from what was said, but from the raw palpable desperation in his voice. Returning home to Lisa, I was a mix of emotions. The relief of having discovered the truth was tangled with sorrow for the ordeal I had put her through. Our conversation that evening was one of the most intense we had ever had. I recounted every detail, from the digital inconsistencies to the painful confession of her old friend, Lisa listened, her face a canvas of changing emotions, shock, sadness, and finally relief. I never doubted you, not really, she said, her hand reaching across to squeeze mine, a physical reconnect that spoke volumes of her trust and forgiveness. But knowing how far you went to clear this up, that means everything. Each day felt like walking on a tightrope, balancing between normalcy and the undercurrent of doubt and suspicion that the anonymous photos had introduced into our lives. During the day we tried to keep to our usual routines. Lisa went to work, and I handled my business from home, but the evenings, once a time for relaxation and togetherness, had subtly shifted. We still sat down for dinner together, still talked about our day, 
but the conversations often felt strained, punctuated by pauses that seemed to carry more weight than the words themselves. I noticed small changes in Lisa's behavior. She was quieter than usual, her smiles didn't reach her eyes as they used to, and she seemed to retreat into herself more often. It wasn't overt. Anyone who didn't know her as well as I did might not have noticed anything at all. But to me, these were loud alarms over the silent sound of our growing distance. Trying to bridge this gap, I made efforts to engage her in activities we both enjoyed, watching our favorite TV shows, going for walks in the park, trying out new recipes together. Sometimes these moments felt like old times, and a sense of hope would bubble up within me. But more often, they served as stark reminders of the ease and comfort that seemed just out of reach. As nights turned into weeks, the uncertainty began to weave itself into the fabric of our daily lives. Each loving gesture, each shared laugh, was shadowed by the unspoken questions that lingered between us. Was this real, or just a facade? Could we truly get back to where we once were, or had something irrevocably shifted? The ongoing uncertainty was exhausting, both emotionally and mentally. There were days I felt optimistic, buoyed by moments of closeness, or a particularly good day spent together. But there were also nights I lay awake, staring at the ceiling, wondering if the foundation we built our relationship on was strong enough to withstand this storm. In these moments of solitude, I realized how much of life is out of our control, how circumstances can change with startling rapidity, and how the known can become unknown in the blink of an eye. Yet it also underscored the importance of what remained constant the effort, the choice to strive for understanding and to cling to the fragments of normalcy that could still be salvaged. As Lisa and I committed to moving forward together, choosing trust over suspicion, we sought the guidance of a couple's therapist. This decision marked the beginning of a new chapter in our relationship, one that required facing our vulnerabilities and insecurities head-on. Our first therapy session was tentative, as we both navigated the unfamiliar territory of discussing our deepest fears with a stranger. The therapist, Dr. Helen, provided a safe space, her office a sanctuary words that often went unspoken could finally be aired. We discussed the impact of the photos, and I shared my feelings of betrayal, not just by the anonymous sender but also by my own doubts about Lisa. Lisa spoke candidly about her sense of violation and the hurt caused by my suspicions. It felt as though our years together, our moments of intimacy, weren't enough to keep your trust in me, she said, her voice steady but tinged with sadness. Dr. Helen encouraged us to explore these feelings further, pushing us to understand not just the immediate reactions to the photos but also the deeper, underlying issues in our relationship. Trust isn't just built on faith, she explained. It's also built on the foundation of understanding each other's fears and vulnerabilities. Over several sessions we delved into our pasts, my previous marriage that had instilled a deep-seated fear of being deceived again, and Lisa's experience with being unjustly accused in her professional life which made her fiercely protective of her integrity. Understanding these aspects of each other helped us see how quickly we could trigger each other's insecurities without meaning to. As we progressed in therapy, our homework was to practice transparency and vulnerability. We scheduled regular check-ins at home, where we shared anything that weighed on us, no matter how small it seemed. These moments were awkward at first, laden with hesitations, but gradually they became our truth sessions filled with raw and honest exchanges. Therapy sessions were interspersed with activities designed to rebuild our emotional connection. We revisited places that held special memories for both of us, like the park where we had picnicked on our first date, and the beach where we celebrated our first anniversary. Each visit was an opportunity to discuss not just the past but our dreams for the future slowly weaving new threads into the tapestry of our marriage. Dr. Helen suggested we write letters to each other, not texts or emails, but old-fashioned pen and paper letters. Writing allowed us to express thoughts and feelings that were too difficult to say out loud. Reading Lisa's letters, I saw the depth of her love and her pain, her commitment to us, and her fears about losing what we had. My responses echoed my resolve to move past my doubts, to affirm my trust in her, and my gratitude for her strength and patience. Halfway through the year, we decided to renew our vows. It was a simple ceremony, just us and a few close friends and family in the same little chapel where we had married. Standing before Lisa, repeating my commitment to her, felt profoundly different this time. It was a promise not just of love, but of faith in our growth and understanding as a couple. As we continued therapy, we learned to embrace not just the easy love of good days, 
but also the challenging love of bad days. We recognize that while the scars of this ordeal might never completely fade, they were testament to our resilience and commitment to each other. Through it all, Lisa and I learned to navigate this new reality, finding solace in our resilience, and in the understanding that while uncertainty might be a part of our lives for now, it didn't have to define our relationship. We were more than this crisis, and with time, perhaps we could rebuild what seemed threatened, finding new depths of trust and commitment amidst the turmoil. Thanks for watching till the end. Wishing you an awesome day. Feel free to drop a comment if you've got more to share. I'd love to hear from you.